Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Inspecting Curb Ramps webinar. My name is Mike Fitch with the Ohio LTAP Center here at ODOT, and we appreciate your participation. As we get started, please take a moment to locate the questions box in the GoToWebinar panel. During the presentation today, please use the questions box to send in any questions you might have. Looking at the handouts section of the GoToWebinar panel, please note also that a PDF copy of the course presentation is available for reference. With that, we will go ahead and turn things over to our instructor, Ron Eck, with the West Virginia LTAP Center. Hello. Hi, Mike. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Good to see such a good turnout for this session on inspecting curb ramps. As Mike said, I'm Ron Eck with the West Virginia LTAP Center. I'm joining you from Morgantown, West Virginia this afternoon. Uh, you can see on the title slide my email address. If after the session questions or concerns or something come up, feel free to contact me that way. I'm always glad to try to respond. Before we get started, I'd like to ask Mike if he please would uh, launch the first polling question. I have a couple polling questions just to help me get a feel for who's here today and who's participating. Yes. Thanks, Ron. We have opened the first poll question, and we see the responses are arriving already, which is good. So we will uh, give some time for people to respond. All right, and we've got about 80% of the group responding already. So we will close the poll and share the results. Okay, so Ron, 37% said state agency, 18% said local government field side, 22% said local government office side, 23% said private sector consultant, and 0% said private sector construction contractor. Okay, very good. So a good variety of folks here. That's great to see. Hopefully we'll have some good questions and comments. And now, Mike, if you wouldn't mind putting up the, the second and final poll question. Yes. And the second question is open. What is your role with respect to curb ramps? And Ron, for this one, they can check uh, multiple responses, correct? Correct, yes. Okay, we will close the poll and share the results. So Ron, 47% said design, 22% construction, 56% inspection, 13% maintenance, and 39% administration. Okay, again, a good variety. Thank you all for participating in that. Helps me understand better who's here today. Well, with that, let's look at our agenda for today. We have a lot to cover, and so we'll get right into it. We'll start with a brief background, a little bit about terminology and definitions, look at the tools that are needed for curb ramp inspection. Then we'll look at the basic requirements for curb ramps or sidewalk to street transitions. There's three types, perpendicular ramps, parallel ramps, and blended transitions. We'll kind of review some curb ramp basics, talk a little bit also about the detectable warning surfaces, the truncated domes, and we'll wrap up with Ron's top 10 curb ramp mistakes. A few disclaimers here at the start. I guess we always need the legal disclaimers at the start, but this session, I prepared it for a general audience, like, like my question asked, of design, people who design, construct, maintain, operate curb ramps, but it's based on PROAG, the Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines. And I realize that some agencies go, in, go above and beyond PROAG. For example, PROAG's minimum width of the pedestrian access route is four feet. A number of agencies use five feet as the minimum width, and that's fine. That's great to go above and beyond, but just be sure you follow 
the relevant criteria for your jurisdiction or your agency. And keep in mind, again, mine is based on PROAG. Also, the session's not meant to provide examples or illustrations for every field condition or ADA criteria. The engineers, contractors, and inspectors who deal with ramps are responsible for understanding and complying with all the relevant equal access laws. Also, I'll show you a number of photos of kind of where to measure grades or slopes and the orientation of the level, but I want to note that these are not meant to show how many measurements to take, since this also probably varies from agency to agency. Again, follow your agency's policy on the number of measurements. If your agency has no policy, maybe that's why you're here today, my suggestion would be for a five foot wide by five foot long curb ramp, take at least two measurements of the landing running slope and the cross slope and three measurements of the ramp grade and cross slope. If you have a wider or longer ramp, add an additional row of measurements for each additional two feet of width or length. If the surface does not appear to be planar, take additional measurements where it appears to be warped and record the steepest slope measured. Why is inspection so important? Well, one reason is it's the law. The Americans with Disabilities Act signed into law back in 1990. The actual law, we might say, or what's what part of ADA is law, is the 2010 ADA Design Standards, or ADAG. But the issue with ADAG, for those of us that work in the public rights of way, is that ADAG is intended for buildings and on-site facilities. It's not really adapted to or intended for the public right of way. So the US Access Board has issued the PROAG guidelines, the Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines. However, these are still in draft form. But the recommendation, my recommendation, the recommendation of Federal Highway Administration, the Department of Justice, and also the courts are telling this, telling us this by their rulings, is that we should be following PROAG. In fact, some agencies across the country at the state and local level have already adopted PROAG. So it's the law, but also to me, it's the right thing to do so we can accommodate the different users and make sure our facilities uh, are friendly for and usable by both the mobility impaired, people in wheelchairs, those who use canes, crutches or braces or walkers, that they're able to access the facilities. And also another group, user group is the visually impaired, both those who are blind and may use a cane or a service animal, but also individuals with low vision who may not use any assistive device, but still need tactile or color contrast uh, cues to be able to navigate the built environment. And I've just put a sampling here of uh, some of the possible users, and you can see each one has different mobility needs. And this, this doesn't even nearly include the total variety of different types of assistive devices and uh, users on the facilities. But it shows some of the challenges to be able to build and design facilities that can accommodate each of these users with their different needs. Hey, Ron. Yes, sir. We do have a quick question from the questions box. On the previous sure. slide, the question is, how long will PROAG remain in draft status? <laughs> I should have anticipated that. That always comes up. And in fact, I've been teaching these classes for probably 10 years or so now, because the current version of PROAG is 2011. And I used to give predictions of when it would, <laughs> would become law. I've stopped doing that now because I was wrong so often. But uh, let me just share with you, I, I've been to two national meetings this year where, uh, and I'm not going to put the blame on them, but two uh, Federal Highway Administration officials have been present. It was not the same person. And each of them seemed pretty confident that by like October or November of this year, PROAG will be signed into law. So I, I don't know. That's, that's not my opinion. That's what these federal officials 
relayed. I, personally, I hope that's the case. I hope it will be relatively soon. Uh, but at this point, I, there's really no definite answer yet. But let's hope by later this year, say the later latter quarter of this year, it will be signed into law. All right. Thanks, Ron. Mm -hmm. Let's look briefly at some terminology and definitions as we go through the uh, presentation today. And note that in what I present, when I say grade, that refers to the finished grade, not string line grade or forms or wet concrete. And also remember, there's no allowance for construction tolerance. So PROAG, for example, calls for a maximum 2% cross slope on the pedestrian access route or for a ramp. Uh, and if your contractor or if your concrete crew says the best we can do is plus or minus 0.5%, then we should be designing the facilities for one and a half percent so that when it's built, it won't exceed 2%. Just keep that in mind in your work. First term we'll look at is blended transition, and we'll talk more about the specifics of this later, but also called a depressed corner, but it's basically uh, the pedestrian street crossing. You can see the curb is removed at the entire corner, all the way around the uh, curb radius there to allow a transition people to move between the sidewalk and the street. And a blended transition, the gradient must be 5% or less, as opposed to a curb ramp where it's 8.3%. Cross slope, I just talked about cross slope. Of course, that's the grade at right angles to the direction of pedestrian travel. And if you ever get in a manual wheelchair, this is probably the thing that you will feel first. As soon as you start putting that chair in motion, it will probably pull to the right or the left, depending on the cross slope of the surface you're on. And that's why it's so critical that we not exceed the maximum values because for individual in a manual chair, it takes considerable effort to try to maintain a straight line path on a steeply sloped, uh, steeply cross sloped surface. Curb ramps, I've already mentioned those. These are ramps that cut through or built or are built up to the curb to accomplish a change in elevation at the curb face. And there's two types of curb ramps. There's perpendicular ramps, you see illustrated here, and there's a parallel ramp. And we'll talk in more detail about each of these shortly. The detectable warning surface, or DWS, these are truncated domes aligned in a square or radial grid pattern and the surface needs to contrast visually with the adjacent sidewalk, gutter, street, or road. And under PROAG, the basic rule of thumb is these need to be placed at all intersections to streets the entire width of the ramp. Or I like to say, use the detectable warning everywhere the curb is missing at a street crossing. And these are designed, you can see in the image here, these are designed to be detected by the long cane. But I think I mentioned not everybody with a vision impairment uses a cane. Those with low vision typically do not use a cane. So this surface is also designed to be detectable underfoot, meaning when a low vision pedestrian steps on it, that pattern of truncated domes is something they can sense or feel underfoot, and that's their indication that uh, they're about to make a street crossing. So these are warning surfaces to let the visually impaired know they're about to make a street crossing, or in some cases in our built environment that maybe there's a at-grade railroad crossing where they're going to have to cross the railroad tracks. Flares. You see flares here. This is a gradual widening of the side of the curb ramp on one end. And they are needed when the surface adjacent to the ramp is a paved surface where pedestrians are likely to walk, or I call it a pedestrian circulation path. The maximum slope of the flare is 10% measured parallel to the curb. And something maybe to keep in mind is that the flares are not part of the pedestrian access route. In other words, it's not intended that they will be used by a person using 
a mobility assistive device. So you might say, why are they there? The purpose of the flares is for the safety of able-bodied pedestrians. If the flares were much steeper than 10%, there's a danger of tripping hazards created for able-bodied pedestrians. Grade breaks. This is the line where two surface planes with different grades meet. And as I say, the surfaces are generally considered planar when all of the measured cross slopes and running slopes on a surface are equal. If you have low spots greater than a quarter inch under a two foot level, then the surface will not be considered planar. And all grade breaks need to be flush. There shouldn't be any lips that could be a hindrance or, or to someone with an assistive device or could be a tripping hazard. I keep mentioning the pedestrian access route or the PAR as it's called. This is the continuous unobstructed path of travel provided for pedestrians with disabilities. It can be within or coinciding with a pedestrian circulation path. Now notice in the image here, let me get my pointer. In the image here, the pedestrian access route is this part of the sidewalk along the storefronts. It complies with PROAG in terms of width, cross slope, and so forth. The entire pedestrian circulation path would be from the back of curb to the storefronts. So some pedestrians can also walk in this area. So in this case, the PAR is within the pedestrian circulation path. Running slope, that's the grade that's parallel to the direction of pedestrian travel. So it looks like we have an inspector there near the top of the ramp and in the direction he's facing toward the right side of the photo, if he were to start walking in that direction, take a step, he, we could say he's going down the grade or the running slope. Turning space. This is the area where turning maneuvers are performed by people with assistive devices, wheelchairs, walkers, crutches. And it is critical that it needs to be level. And when I say level in this class, I mean 2% cross slope or less. If no turning takes place, then it's called a landing. And this one that you see here is both a turning space and a landing, if you will. Uh, if, if I'm proceeding, in my wheelchair from the front of the slide to the back, it's a landing, I'm not making any turns. But if I'm turning to the right or the left, then that level space functions as a turning space. And we won't talk about this today other than my mentioning it here, but you know, if you're inspecting ramps as part of the construction project, not inspecting existing ramps, but you're constructing a ramp, it's important that the temporary traffic control zone for that construction work be compliant with PROAG and the Manual and Uniform Traffic Control Devices, Part 6. And this photo shows how not to do it. Uh, this community, on the one hand, I commend them because they're going to, I took this last summer, they are going to resurface these streets this summer so they upgraded the curb ramps, brought them into compliance the year before, which is great. So they'll be ready to go once the paving takes place. However, I'm gonna ding them because notice their work zone traffic control is neither accessible nor detectable and does not have an alternate pedestrian access route. So make sure your construction projects for ramps comply with PROAG and the MUTCD. Be sure you have the necessary tools. Uh, one of those is digital levels. I'll talk about those very shortly. Uh, another one is an engineer's metal measuring tape. I would say capable of measuring in tenths or hundreds of a foot. I'd record the linear dimensions to the nearest tenth of a foot. Unless your agency policy is, is different than that, then certainly follow your agency policy have some sort of writing or recording tool. Maybe you use a mobile phone or a tablet and that's that's fine. Uh, maybe you use pencil and paper, that's fine too, but make sure you have the appropriate uh, tools or devices to record the necessary information. And it's probably a good idea to have some temporary pavement markers like chalk or lumber crayons 
or something like that in case you need to make some temporary markings on a sidewalk or pavement. I mentioned digital levels. I would recommend having two sizes of digital levels, a 24 inch tool, maybe the basic tool. And one reason 24 inches is recommended is because that's often the wheelbase of a manual wheelchair. And so the tool kind of matches up with what the wheelbase of a manual wheelchair would be. But if you're measuring, for example, the slope of a top of a curb or something, or in the gutter pan, the two foot level may not be able to be accommodated. And so I recommend too having a six inch tool for measuring those kind of things like top of, top of curb. In terms of using the levels, be sure to calibrate them according to the manufacturer's recommendations at the time of the inspection. I would say calibrate daily. Uh, if you accidentally drop it, the level, for example, calibrate it after that, that shock that it took. Or if there's, say, a 20 degree Fahrenheit temperature change. I think we've had that at least here in the east. West Virginia and Ohio probably have had that in the last few months. I, We've had days where it started in, say, the upper 60s, and by nightfall, after the front moved through, the temperature might have been in the 30s or upper 20s. And I don't know if you'd be doing construction that day if the front's coming through, but if you're inspecting existing ramps, you probably want to recalibrate your level if, it's, if there's been a significant temperature change. And this last one wasn't on the original version of my slides, but I've added this based on the recommendation of, of folks like you who've attended the class. They say, be sure to remind people, make sure the slope measurements are in percentage mode. So be sure to check that. You don't want to, for example, record something that's maybe in degrees. Make sure your device is in the percentage mode and record to the nearest tenth of a percent with respect to true horizontal. I mentioned earlier, measure your forms and then measure post construction to ensure compliance. Well, now let's get into the basic requirements for inspecting curb ramps. We'll start with the perpendicular ramps, which you see illustrated here. And just a couple of things I would note. Notice we have the PAR identified. The pedestrian access route is at the back of the sidewalk here. In fact, it includes the turning space here. But notice the pedestrian circulation path is from the back of curb to the back of sidewalk. So in this case, the PAR is within the pedestrian circulation path. And because the sides of the ramp are within a pedestrian circulation path, we need to have the flared sides shown here kind of in that orange or reddish color. And notice a flush transition from the gutter here to the ramp. I'll say more about that probably throughout the presentation. Here are the relevant perpendicular curb ramp measurements. Notice I say suggested landing running slope and suggested landing cross slope, one and a half percent. That's because the maximum is two percent. I believe I indicated earlier we should be designing for one and a half percent to make sure that when it's built, it's not more than 2%. The landing length should match the curb ramp width and the landing width should match the sidewalk width. The ramp cannot be steeper or should not be steeper than one in 12 or 8.33%. Uh, some agencies design it for seven and a half percent so that when it's built, it won't be more than 8.3%. And note that the gutter slope and the ramp running slope should be the same. The flares, as I mentioned, 10% or less slope measured parallel to the curb. The detectable warning surface should be a two foot length for the full width of the ramp. And of course the sidewalk cross slope, 2% or less, the counter gutter slope, meaning in the street where the pedestrians are in the crosswalk, 5% or less. And the maximum grade of a crosswalk is 
Also, we might note ramp cross slope. It's a function of the traffic control on the roadway being crossed. And also, we, it, the slide says ramp cross slope, but also this would mean the cross slope of the cross walk. Notice if the roadway is stop or yield controlled, the maximum ramp cross slope or crosswalk cross slope is 2%. If the roadway is signalized or uncontrolled, then the ramp cross slope is 5% max. And for a mid block crossing, the ramp cross slope can match the street grade. I want to note that, of course, we may need some design and construction modifications for curb ramps to be installed on roadways with longitudinal grades exceeding 5%. And here you see a drawing showing that transition from uh, level turning space, 2% slope, to the 14% grade uh, on the roadway profile. And I think I picked this up at a uh, presentation given by the Access Board. And people have told me they use something similar in their agency. But also, I want to note that not everybody agrees with that design. I've had other people tell me their agency would not use such a design. So this is one of the gray areas of PROAG. And as I say in the second bullet, the maximum rate of change of cross slope for a ramp like this is unclear. I think we need some research on this topic. And my advice would just be be thoughtful about what's happening at such locations. In fact, some agencies, and I, I hardly recommend this, is some agencies have purchased manual wheelchairs and they will actually have the, the inspectors or the other people in the field or even the designers go up and down various ramp designs with or using the manual wheelchair. And I think that gives you a great feel for, as I say in that, uh, last bullet, what's happening, you can really appreciate what's happening in terms of the rate of change of cross slope and things when you're in a manual chair. So I, I encourage that sort of thing to help develop a better understanding of how that uh, rate of change of cross slope will affect someone either in a wheelchair or using a walker or crutches or other assistive device. So where do we measure each element? Uh, I put it in form of steps maybe to make it easier to follow, but step one, and these steps of course can be done in any order. This is just my order. But step one would be to check the landing cross slope. So the level is on the landing perpendicular to the road. And then my step two would be to check the landing running slope. So place the level on the landing parallel to the road. My step three would be check the ramp running slope. So place the level on the left, the right, the center of the ramp perpendicular to the road. Here we're just showing, I'm just showing it in the center of the ramp. My step four would be to check the ramp cross slope. So place the level on the front and back of the ramp parallel to the road. Step five would be to check the left flare slope. So place the level on the left flare at the back of the curb parallel to the road. I see this done incorrectly a number of times. Remember, the measurement needs to be made parallel to the curb. And then step six would be, of course, check the right flare slope, put the level on the right flare at the back of the curb, but make sure it's parallel to the road or the curb. Step seven would be to check the running slopes in the gutter area. The curb ramp running slope, or the, I'm sorry, the curb running slope and the ramp running slope should be the same. And this is where you may find use for the six inch level. And I'm just showing multiple levels here. Obviously you can just use one level and make multiple measurements, but we're just showing the orientation of the level here. And I think you can appreciate maybe a two foot level may not work in this situation. So that's why I think it's advantageous to have a, a six inch level. Place the level on top of the curb perpendicular to the curb face. 
in terms of measuring the counter slope, you know, that's the grade of the street or gutter pan perpendicular to the street or gutter pan. And again, if it fits, use a two foot level, otherwise use the six inch level. And I've been talking about wheelchairs and gutter pans. I'll probably mention it again. This is very important that the vertical discontinuities or lips that may seem insignificant to able-bodied pedestrians can pose a real challenge to those using assistive mobility devices. So they should not be present at the transition from the curb ramp to the street crossing. And this is a staged scene here. There was nobody in this wheelchair. I pushed the wheelchair to this location. But what we're trying to show is notice there's a pretty good lip there. And when the small front wheels of that wheelchair hit that lip, they stop. They stop abruptly. And there have been cases, sadly, around the country where someone who's been in the chair has been actually catapulted or pitched out of the chair onto the sidewalk, which obviously is, is not a good thing at all. So it's it's important to pay attention to having smooth transitions at the base of the curb ramp and also at grade breaks and other places like that that I mentioned. So that was perpendicular ramps. Now let's look at parallel curb ramps. And here you see a photo of a parallel ramp. Notice we have ramps on either side that go from sidewalk level down to street level. So the turning space is down here, this greenish tinted uh, feature. And I want to point out too, notice here, we've identified the pedestrian access route, the PAR. In this case, the PAR coincides with the pedestrian circulation route. They're kind of one in the same here. The pedestrian circulation route is the same as the pedestrian access route. And again, notice I kind of highlight, should be a flush transition here at the base of the ramp. I guess maybe one other thing I should note, uh, they've darkened it here, you can't really see the detectable warning, but this would be the detectable warning surface, this darker green rectangle. And with this particular design, with the parallel curb ramp, the detectable warning surface is part of the turning space. The parallel curb ramp measurements to be made include the suggested landing running slope. And again, I'm recommending it be designed for one and a half percent so that when it's built, it won't be more than two percent. The landing width and length should be four feet minimum. The ramp cross slope, I'd suggest one and a half percent so that when it's built, it won't be more than two percent. Again, a two foot length of detectable warning surface, the full width of the ramp, and that's what we see here. Notice it's the full width. Everywhere the curb is missing, there should be a detectable warning surface. Sidewalk cross slope, 2% or less. Counter gutter slope, 5% or less. And maybe, and this is optional or dependent on your site conditions, a vertical curb behind the landing. And it appears that's what we have here. Notice there's a vertical curb behind the landing. That's not required. That's going to depend on your, your site conditions. But I should note that vertical curb creates what's known as a constrained condition, meaning the footrests of the wheelchair will hit that curb. They can't project beyond the turning space. So in the case of a constrained condition like this, the dimension of the ramp here from the back of the curb to that face of curb or little wall there is five feet because in a constrained condition that needs to be five feet in the direction of travel. I think we've talked about everything there. The, the cross slope criteria again are the same as I mentioned for the perpendicular ramp. They're a function of the traffic control on the road or street being crossed. So I won't won't repeat those, but they are identical to the, the ones I showed you for the perpendicular ramp. So let's look at where do we measure these elements. And again, these are my steps. You can do it in your own order. But my step one is to check the landing running slope. 
to place the level at the back and front of the landing parallel to the road or street. And notice in this case, they do have a curb section back here, which does create a uh, constrained condition for someone in a wheelchair is coming toward the ramp here and turning right or left. And so this dimension from the, the face of this curb to the back of the curb here would be five feet. If this, if the grass was flush with this lower level here, the turning space, that's unconstrained condition. And in that case, the relevant dimension from the back of curb to the face of this curb is four feet. But here it looks like probably for, you know, to prevent soil and sediment from sort of sloughing down or washing onto the turning space, they have a little curb there or retaining wall. And I, I think that's probably a good, good practice, but it may not always be required. My step two would be to check the landing cross slope. So place the level perpendicular to the road on the left, right, and center of the landing. Step three would be to check the ramp left running slope. So place the level at the curb parallel with the road. Step four would be to check the ramp left cross slope. So place the level at the left and right side of the left ramp perpendicular to the road. Step five is check the ramp, the right ramp running slope, place the level at the curb parallel with the road. Step six is check the ramp, the right ramp cross slope. So place the level at left and right side of the right ramp perpendicular to the road and then measure the curb running slope. Again, put the level on top of the curb perpendicular to the face of curb. And this is where you may need to use the six inch level if the two foot won't fit. And same way with the counter slope, measure them perpendicular to the gutter flow line. So those are the two types of curb ramps, perpendicular ramps and parallel ramps. A variation on that is the combination curb ramp. You can see here in the left image, notice we're ramping the sidewalk down to a level turning space. And this sidewalk here in the, on the left side of the image also ramps down to the turning space. And then below the turning space, there's a ramp, two ramps actually. And so all of these ramps need to be 8.33% or less and have the appropriate width and cross slope. We see another variation, just one ramp here in the right image, but this is a combination ramp as well. The sidewalk ramps down to a level turning space, which in this case serves just one ramp. Notice on the left image, the turning space serves two ramps and that's, that's fine. They can overlap like that. So that's basically all I'll say about the curb ramps the two types and then the variation with the combination ramp. The third type of sidewalk to street transition is the blended transition. And as I think I alluded to earlier, notice the curb is missing around this entire corner. And so we need detectable warning surface, the little stippled area here, to alert the visually impaired that they're about to enter the street. And recall with a blended transition, the maximum grade is 5%. And I think if you look at PROAG, I forget the exact wording, but it says something about a turning space is not required. And that's generally true, but you have to look at the situation. Notice here the way this exists. It's possible that someone in a wheelchair may be coming from the upper left here and one not wanting to cross the street, just go to the sidewalk headed toward the upper right. So you still have to have a turning space here for someone making that turning maneuver. That is someone who's not using the blended transition. So you have to look at each case individually. In terms of the blended transition measurements, running slope, 5% maximum. Again, a two foot length of detectable warning surface, the full width of the blended transition. I hate to keep harping on it, but it is important everywhere the curb is missing. So from where my pointer is here, 
the curb is missing all the way over to this location. So that needs to have, and it does have here in this drawing, a detectable warning surface. Sidewalk cross slope should be 2% or less. The counter gutter slope, 5% or less. And same cross slope requirements as we have talked about before apply. It, it, again, it's a function of the traffic control on the road or street being crossed. So where do we make the measurements? Well, step one would be to check the ramp cross slope, put the level perpendicular to the road in front of the domes. Step two would be to check the ramp running slope, place the level parallel to the road. Step three, check the curb ramp running slope. And you've seen this image before, it'd be the same procedure. And next step then should be step four would be to do the check the counter slopes. So those are those are the three types of sidewalk to street transitions provided for in PROAG. I did want to mention a few curb ramp basics. First thing I'll mention is notice we need to design the ramp for each location, at least this is my opinion, and not simply refer to a standard drawing. Because really, in my mind, you have to engineer each ramp for each corner, because each corner is different in terms of topography, utilities, right-of-way, buildings, those sorts of features. So you really have to engineer each ramp for each corner because each one will be slightly different. And the reality is, of course, and you all realize this, most ramps don't look like these cookie cutter ramps that I may show in some of these photos. It's also critical that grade breaks be perpendicular to the direction of travel. And sadly, as I travel the country, I see some of these, still see some of these, I call these skewed ramps. The, the ramp has to be perpendicular to the curb so that both wheels of the wheelchair enter and leave the ramp at the same time. I know this is a cartoon, but it's technically accurate. And if you look closely, that small front wheel of the wheelchair is off the ground. And any time one or more of the wheels of a manual wheelchair is off the ground, the wheelchair, the stability of it is jeopardized. It could easily flip over or tip over. So that is not a good thing from a safety standpoint. So it is important that the ramps intersect the curb at right angles. In fact, I mentioned earlier, I'm a fan of, you know, kind of checking your project out once it's done before it's signed off on with, with a manual wheelchair. That's some, a key thing to look for. If you have a wheelchair and you're kind of going through your project at the end, doing the final inspection or punch list or whatever, anywhere where the one or more of those wheels of the manual chair is off the ground, that's something that in my mind would need to be corrected before you sign off on that project. because That affects the safety of those with mobility devices. I keep mentioning it because it is important Transitions should be flush, there should be no lips. Maximum allowable in ADA is a quarter inch vertical elevation difference. Anything higher than that is a, is a, can be a barrier, can be a tripping hazard, so be, be alert to that. The curb ramps, as I keep mentioning, must extend the full width of a shared use path, whether it's a shared use path or a ramp, traditional ramp or whatever. And here we have a hard to tell, but this is a shared use path kind of running underneath the trees here. And here's the curb ramp where that path intersects the street. And notice the detectable warning is the full width of the ramp, which is the full width of the multi-use trail or shared use trail. So I think that's a good, uh, good design there. I'm surprised there's no marked crosswalk at that location, but that, that's a different topic. But in terms of the ramp design, it looks to be okay. Another thing to keep in mind is that if a crossing, meaning a pedestrian crossing, is prohibited, it should be closed off to all pedestrians. And here's a couple scenarios. The one on the left, I need to get a new slide. 
imagine this is con a concrete surface here, not grass. Imagine this is a concrete surface. And I've seen situations where you have a concrete surface like that, and the agency, the municipality, doesn't want pedestrians crossing at that location. It could be for safety reasons or other reasons. And so they'll just put up a sign that says crosswalk closed or no pedestrians beyond this point. The problem with that is that's a violation of PROAG because that sign does not communicate with the visually impaired. So what you need to do is like they did here, put up some type of barricade or railing or something to let the visually impaired know that the, they're not to continue beyond that point. Because if this was just, uh, say, concrete here and then a curb, the visually impaired would know that that's a curb. They know they've reached the street. They learn that in orientation and mobility training. But if there was just a sign there, they'd have no idea that they're not supposed to cross there. And so they would unknowingly enter the street and cross at that location. So if we want to prohibit crossings, we need to have, you can have the sign, but you also have to have some sort of barricade as well. Or another way of handling that is shown here in the right-hand image. Notice this sidewalk that comes kind of from the bottom here, angles up toward the top. Uh, it ends here at the corner. There's no crosswalk, maybe because it looks like these streets are kind of offset somewhat. Another way to do it is like they've done here, have a grass strip person using the cane can detect that grass and they can realize that there's no path toward the top or toward the north that they'll have to either go right or left. So either have a barricade or some sort of detectable surface to let the visually impaired know that the sidewalk has ended. It would not be good practice to just continue this sidewalk to the corner here and then put up a sign saying no pedestrians. Again, that discriminates against the visually impaired. They cannot see that sign. Mike, we've been going about 45 minutes. Are any questions come in or comments? Uh, yes, Ron. <laughs> we have quite a few questions. <laughs> yeah. So uh, from the earlier part of the presentation, we have a question from Francis. And we might have discussed some of these already, but we'll see if you have any additional comments. Question was, what do we do for the curb transition, 10% max, if the road has a steeper grade? Good, good question. Yeah, that's why some of these, and I encourage all these questions, but sometimes you may hear me say the answer is it depends. And I'm not trying to be a smart aleck or a wise guy or put you down or anything, but it's just, as many of you know, in, in this field, it's, things are very context sensitive, so you really have to do look at every corner or every location because the solution may be a little bit different. Uh, there, in that situation, you know, without having, and I realize what you're saying because I, I, here in West Virginia, we have a lot of steep, steeply, or streets with street uh, steep profiles. I would say, you know, check, make sure everything is accessible in terms of the ramp accessible to the maximum extent feasible. And since I guess your question was more about the flare, which remember the flare is for the safety of able-bodied pedestrians, I would look at it and just kind of, you know, look at it from the standpoint of are we creating a tripping hazard or some sort of issue for the able-bodied pedestrians? So, and I know the answer is going to depend on the specifics, but Keep that in mind with the flares, is that the flares, it's not anticipated that someone in a wheelchair or with a walker is going to be crossing the flare, but able-bodied pedestrians may very well be crossing that flare and check to see that we're not creating some sort of safety issue for uh, the able-bodied pedestrians. And it, it uh, just as an example, and I know I don't have an image to help you, but I remember a number of years ago, I was in Washington, D.C. at a conference, and if any of you have been to Washington, and I don't mean to pick on them because they're now remediating things, but their original ramp designs in the District of Columbia used very steep flares, very steep flares. And I remember one morning, I was in town for this conference and going to a session, and it had snowed about an inch or so overnight. and you know, we were downtown during peak hours, so of course there was a crush of pedestrians on the sidewalk. 
and we were stopped waiting for the walk indication to come up. And when it, the walk indication came up, you know, this platoon of people started across the street, as usually happens. And next thing I knew, I was laying on the sidewalk on my back. And apparently what happened is one of those steep flares, it was covered with snow and probably packed snow. And I guess I just stepped on that and my foot went out from under me and I fell down. So that's that's the sort of issue I'm, I'm sort of looking at is it may be a tripping hazard or it could be a, you know, I'm not sure where you're from, but if if you have snow and ice during the winter time, be alert that, you know, very steep slopes in that area, uh, if those become covered with snow or ice, can that present a slipping hazard for the able-bodied pedestrians? But good question. Anything thanks. else? Yeah, thanks, Ron. Next question was from Kevin. He said, what about DWS at shopping centers and the entire width of recessed curb? Can I delay that till a little bit later? Because we we, we'll we talk about that a little bit more. Yes, and if okay. I, if I forget, please remind me and repeat that question. But yeah, we'll talk about that shortly. Question from Nick. Do you have to put domes at alleys? A good question. Can I delay that one too? We'll talk about that. <laughs> Got it. Uh, do you want to do a question about the perpendicular ramp? Sure. Okay. Question from Kenny. He said, on the perpendicular ramp, my understanding is that there needs to be a landing pad at the top and bottom of each ramp. Additionally, under PROAG, the bottom landing pad needs to be entirely outside of the traveled way or through traffic, of through traffic. We've been trying to design ramps to have a landing pad basically in the DW area. Is that over engineering based on PROAG? Is that bottom landing pad less of a deal breaker? Oh, good question. And let me see if, I don't wanna waste time going back to too many slides here, but let's see if I can find one that might sort of illustrate that. Well, let's let well, actually let's take the perpendicular ramp since that's what your question was about. And these are all pretty well done, I guess. Let's take this one. So yeah, there has to be a level landing slash turning space at the top of each ramp as we talked about and as, as the question uh, indicated. Uh, if I recall the PROAG wording for the bottom of the ramp is there must be a 48 inch by 48 inch clear space, uh, forget how it's worded, but something like within the crosswalk and outside of the vehicle travel path. But that space, it, it just has to be clear space at the bottom of the ramp, it does not have to be level. So it doesn't have to be, maybe the question called it landing pad. It doesn't necessarily have to be a landing pad in the sense of landing implies 2% cross slope or less. It just has to be space. And I think a little bit later, I'll show an example of a ramp that, that doesn't comply with that. I think most of these ramps that I'm showing you probably do, but uh, it just, the, what has to be at the bottom of the ramp is 48 by 48 inches of clear space. It doesn't have to be a landing. I hope that addressed the question. Okay, thanks, Ron. Do you wanna take any more questions or wait till the end? Uh, why don't we wait till the end just to make sure we get through everything, if that's okay. That sounds good, thanks. Okay, so let's see, I guess we were here. Thanks for the good questions, I appreciate those. Uh, one other thing, too, and this is something I added based on comments, mainly from state DOTs, is that the ramps or flares should not be scored. And I don't know if I see these from time to time. Maybe you have seen these. In fact, as I understand it, I think this is the requirement in California. I don't know if we have anyone from California here, but I think their state ADA requirements are such that this is required in California, uh, which is fine. if. if if that's your requirement, you need to do that. But for states where that's not required, my advice is not to do that. Uh, it probably adds extra time or cost to the 
work, but the reality is it's not really detectable with a cane. And if you don't believe me, you can try this yourself, but with the cane, this, this scoring or grooving, whatever you might call that, is not really detectable. I guess it may have a visual cue, obviously, for those of us who are sighted individuals, but assuming the ramps and the flares are properly designed, I don't know that people need a visual cue that they're you know, descending a ramp because those slopes are, are relatively gentle. But if anybody has comments with that or disagrees with me, I'd be glad to hear from you in the, in the chat. Detectable warning surfaces. We had some questions about detectable warning surfaces, and I talked about them briefly earlier. I mentioned that they do need to contrast visually with the adjacent gutter, street, or highway, or the pedestrian access route surface. And that could be either light on dark or dark on light. And actually yellow on light concrete, some people have said, is that enough contrast? And yes, that, that would comply with PROAG. Yellow on uh, light background does provide sufficient contrast. It could be a brick red color, or I've seen hunter green, I've seen blues. Uh, it needs to be color contrast. But having said that, something we've learned from experience that I don't think was anticipated originally is black detectable warnings. Clearly that provides really good contrast on light concrete, but what was learned through experience is that uh, guide dogs or people with certain types of uh, low vision conditions, maybe certain macular degeneration conditions, detect this black pad as a whole in the uh, sidewalk or in the walkway. And I've seen a video, I, I need to copy it and put it in this presentation, I guess, but I've seen a video where the, the guide dog was actually leading its handler around the black detectable warning because the dog perceived it as a hole in the sidewalk. So my advice, this is not in PROAG, it may be in the final version, I'm not sure, but my advice would be use any color that provides good contrast but probably avoid using black. And I know a number of agencies around the country use black. Uh, I'm not suggesting you, you tear all those up immediately and, and replace them, but as you're replacing your detectable warnings, you might think about using another color other than black if you're using black now. Uh, something to keep in mind maybe if you're working with detectable warning surfaces is I like to think of them as parentheses like in English grammar, when we had grammar in high school, they always occur in pairs. So you, you, you open a parentheses and then you close them or reopen them and then close, reclose them. So think about detectable warning surfaces that way. So notice in my little schematic sketch here, we have a couple crosswalks at an intersection. And this looks like maybe a traffic calming project or a bike boulevard project, but notice Vehicular traffic cannot go through the intersection, but bicycles are allowed to. And we have two crosswalks. So let's take the one in the foreground. This detectable warning surface here, let's imagine we have a blind pedestrian crossing from the right to the left. When their cane, or the, if it's a low vision pedestrian, when their foot steps on that surface, it's performing the warning function. It's telling them, stop and check out the situation because you're about to cross a vehicular path. And so they would probably, in this case, it doesn't appear to be any signal, so they would have to listen and judge their crossing based on the sound of traffic, on traffic noise. So what they cross the street, and then would you agree they get to this detectable warning? So we're closing the parentheses, but this is not a warning device or warning function in this direction of travel. This is telling them, hey, you've crossed the street, you're now back on the sidewalk. And then they cross, what's that, maybe four feet or five feet of smooth surface, and then they encounter another detectable warning surface. And here it's performing the warning function. It's saying, hey, you're about to enter traffic. And so they cross the street and we can't see the fourth one over here, but this one, when they encounter that, that's letting them know they've crossed the street or they're out of out of traffic. And the same thing applies to the, the crosswalk on the other side of the street. And there has to be at least a two foot 
minimum smooth surface between successive detectable warning surfaces. This looks going like more than two feet. I, I would estimate that maybe at five feet. So this, this is a good design in terms of the detectable warning surfaces at that crosswalk. And, and this would be a median refuge area. It's six feet or more in the direction of pedestrian travel. You can have medians less than six feet. They're not called refuge areas. They're called pass-throughs or cut-throughs. And if your median island is less than six feet, keep the surface smooth. There should be no detectable warnings. That's why they're called pass-throughs or cut-throughs. We want the pedestrian to keep moving. And if they, if this surface is smooth, they will think they're still in the street, and so they'll keep moving. I think I keep mentioning this. Notice they shall be the full width of the ramp, anywhere the sidewalk is flush with the roadway. So this image on the left here, I think is properly done. Notice where the curb is missing, there's detectable warning. This one on the right, which is actually here in Morgantown, I'm embarrassed to say. Uh, this, I think, was placed by someone who didn't really understand the needs of the visually impaired. Notice the detectable warning is just here, but the curb is missing all the way around here. In fact, I've measured, this is the grade break here, it's a little bit hard to see, but this is the grade break. From the grade break to the back of the curb is eight feet. And under PROAG, if that distance is greater than five feet, you need to put the detectable warnings radially around the corner here. And I urge people rather than just, you know, rely on PROAG, just think, kind of think it through and think about what impact you're having on the visually impaired. Let's imagine, again, I'm asking you to imagine, we have a blind pedestrian using the cane coming from the top of the photo here. And let's say they're using this curb between the sidewalk and the street as their shoreline to help them navigate. The curbs are a good thing for the visually impaired. They can detect them. The problem with curbs is if you're in a wheelchair, curbs are a bad thing because you can't move between the sidewalk and the street. So let's say I'm blind, I'm using my cane, I'm following this curb. Well, what happens here, the curb ends and I could walk right out into the street without even realizing it. I've lost my shoreline, I've lost the curb, and there's no detectable warning, which is how I rely on knowing whether I'm entering a street or not. And so I would just could walk right out into the street without even realizing it. And that's the danger, that's the safety issue created by improper placement of, or kind of incomplete placement of the detectable warning surface. So let me, we had some questions on uh, detectable warnings. Mike, would you mind going back to, to those? I think I've put them aside, but now's probably yeah. a good time to talk about that. Yes, thanks, Ron. So one of the questions was from Kevin. He said, what about DWS at shopping centers? Okay, I wonder, is Kevin, if you wouldn't mind maybe, is, are you talking about sort of within the shopping center site or are you speaking about maybe DWS across, say, the main access drive to and from the mall? Uh, he follows up, the second part of the question was the entire width of recessed curb. Uh yeah, let me let me sort of break it down into two parts. It, 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 let's let's Ron, say it. Yeah, Ron, he says uh, as you approach the store entrance. Okay, so I assume that means kind of from the parking area to the store entrance. Yeah, that would fall. That that's where we sort of get can get into confusion sometimes. The 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 shopping mall or strip mall or whatever it is, or it could be even be a single building. Uh, that would be considered a building and or on-site facility. So that would fall under, that location or that situation would fall under ADAG. And in ADAG, ADAG doesn't really go into ramps and detectable warnings to the level of detail that PROAG does. And in fact, under ADAG, detectable warnings are optional. 
that's why I don't know if folks have noticed, at least around here where I maybe shop or go to businesses, I'll find that some uh, firms, some retailers will have detectable warnings where their you know, crosswalk may cross a, a traffic aisle in the in the mall or in the shopping center, and others won't. And I, I some of my non-public works, non-engineering colleagues will say to me, you know, shouldn't they have the detectable warnings there when you go from the storefront, say headed toward the parking lot? And under PROAG, the correct answer is no, they're not required they're optional. So that's why I'm not sure, I'm hesitating how to answer the question because it, if, it, if it's in the public right of way where a sidewalk crosses the street, then the detectable warnings are required. But on sites on different properties, the, the detectable warnings are optional. Let me give you my thoughts. And this is not, this is just Ron's thoughts. This is not the, uh, the letter of the requirements in ADAG. But if you recall my sort of rule of thumb of when to use detectable warnings is everywhere the curb is missing at a street crossing. And so let me expand on that. I would say, and I don't know exactly where the question is talking about, it doesn't matter, but if that crossing, whatever facility that's being crossed, if that facility looks and acts like a street, then I would put detectable warnings. And let me let me give a couple other examples. Uh, let's take a single family detached home. Everybody's probably familiar with that. Let's and let's say it has a driveway. Single family detached home to a a driveway to a single family detached home. Would everybody agree that that driveway to a single family home does not look or act like a street? There's probably just, what's the trip generation rate for single family homes? Something like 10 vehicles a day or something. So that, I would argue that doesn't look or act like a street. But let's say we have a regional shopping mall, large shopping mall. And there's, let's say there's a private driveway from that mall that intersects a state highway or a city street. Uh, that driveway probably has multiple lanes, right? Probably has maybe two or more lanes inbound. They have two left turn lanes, outbound, right turn lanes, through lanes. It probably even is signalized. I would argue that that driveway, it may be a private driveway, but that driveway for that shopping mall looks and acts like a street. So if we have a sidewalk crossing that driveway, I would argue that we need to have detectable warnings. And I realize there's a lot of gray areas in between there, but the things I would look at are things like traffic volume. I'd look at both average daily traffic and peak hour traffic. I'd look at the curb radius because that affects the speed of traffic entering or leaving the driveway. If the curb radius is pretty large where drivers can go at fairly high speed in and out of the driveway, I would probably put detectable warnings on that sidewalk just because of the speed issue. I'd look at sight distance. Can drivers see pedestrians waiting to cross that driveway or that roadway? If there's sight distance restrictions, and maybe and there was a question that may be coming about alleys. Alleys are, you know, obviously it's gonna depend on the alley, but say alleys I'm envisioning, there's storefronts or the buildings right up to the sidewalk and a driver coming out of the alley can't really see pedestrians on the sidewalk because there's there's walls of the building on both sides. In that case, I would probably put detectable warnings where the sidewalk crossed the alley. But now if where the alley crosses the sidewalk is say adjacent to maybe there's buildings have been torn down and there's little parklets or mini parks adjacent to the alley and sight lines are good and traffic volumes are low in the alley, then I probably would not put detectable warnings. So that's why I keep saying you sort of have to look at your individual condition or situation because each one is going to be different. And before I forget, the other factor I'd look at for a driveway is, or an alley, is traffic control. And again, th this is a gray area in PROAG. So what I'm sharing with you is, is bronze thoughts. But I would say if there's a signal for example, from the mall driveway to the state highway or the city street, 
I would say definitely put detectable warnings. In fact, I even recommend to folks if there's a stop sign at the end of the driveway, I'd probably put detectable warnings. But you know, I've seen alleys where maybe there was no stop sign at the end of the alley where the driveway intersected the city street. Then you had, then I'd look at some of these other factors I mentioned: sight distance, volume, vehicle speeds, that sort of thing. And I would say, so it's a gray area, so there's no right or wrong answer. But I would say, whatever you do, document your decision, whether it's to install them, detectable warnings, or not. And I think I'll say one more thing, and that is that you can see the value of these detectable warnings from a safety standpoint. They're alerting the visually impaired that they're about to become potentially be in conflict with motor vehicles, or they're entering a motor vehicle way, or they're crossing a railroad track. But it is possible to overuse these things. I've seen a residential neighborhood here in West Virginia where I think the designer was misinformed and there are detectable warnings on every driveway to a single family house on that block. So there, there's 16 sets of detectable warnings. And that that is, that's really confusing to the visually impaired. They don't know whether they're at a driveway or at a street. And so keep in mind that it is possible to overuse these things and you can actually create confusion for the visually impaired. So that's why I like to recommend looking at each driveway individually, looking at some of those factors I mentioned, and then making a, a decision of to install it or not. But keep in mind, do, does the driveway look or act like a street? If that's helpful, that's I think that's some good guidelines. So sorry to take so long on that, but that's a good question. And I think a lot of people have questions about that area. Thanks, Ron. There was a similar question from Ian. Are DWS recommended for access to areas like a loading unloading zone where there isn't a street crossing or intention to enter the traveled way? Could you repeat that one more time, please? Yes. Are DWS recommended for access to areas like a loading unloading zone where there isn't a street crossing or intention to enter the traveled way? Uh, good question. And again, it's probably going to depend, I'm not trying to evade the question, but one place, for example, uh, it's obviously different from a loading zone, but in a way it acts the same way, is if, if an agency has accessible on-street parking, parallel parking, on street, the way that the the PAR, the pedestrian access route, is connected through the, to the street is through curb ramps. Even though it's not a curb ramp at a corner, it's a curb ramp to allow access to and from the accessible parking stall. And in those cases, I would say, yes, you do need detectable warnings. And uh, probably in the case of the loading zone as well, but I'm not sure I'd always say that, but probably in the case of a loading zone, you'd probably also want to put detectable warning surfaces. I don't know if the person who asked the question would want to email me a photo or something so I could see the specific situation, I'd be glad to offer comments on that. But I would say generally, probably I would put it at a loading zone. All right, thanks, Ron. Do you want to present more slides and then take questions at the end or? Yeah, why don't we do that? I don't have much more, but just to make sure I can cover everything, why don't we do that and then we'll open it up to questions. Okay. The... I think the last thing we have is my top 10 list of curb ramps, curb ramp mistakes. And unlike the, what is it, the college football playoff selection committee, you know, their, their ranking is pretty important, whether it's one, two, three, four, or whatever. This is just my top 10 list. It's no particular order. But these are things, things that I see and that other folks with various agencies or those with disabilities have talked to me about as some of the common issues that they see. And you'll see some of these we've already talked about. And here's the one I emphasize many times. The ramp needs to be flush with the gutter pan. The mistake is that the ramp is not flush with the gutter pan and we have a, a lip that can catch the small front wheels of the wheelchair. Notice the one on the left here, it looks brand new, but it also looks particularly bad. That looks like several inches there lip. What I'm hoping happened here 
I was just the tourist passing through, but I'm hoping that this agency soon after this came through and resurfaced the street such that this was all flush. But in the meantime, to me, they should have done something there because that lip can really be a, a barrier. And think about it, you have somebody in a wheelchair, can't get up that lip and they're actually out in the street exposed to traffic. So that's, or if they don't see the lip, the wheelchair stops and they're pitched onto the sidewalk. So it, neither one of those is a good situation. Kind of the opposite problem, and you can't see the crosswalk here, but the ramp is on the left side, is the gutter pan is not flush with the crosswalk. So this street was resurfaced, but they didn't mill or taper this. So now as someone's going onto the street, going from the gutter pan to the asphalt, there's a lip that will be difficult to traverse. So keep an eye out for those, those lips or vertical elevation differences. Obstructions in the par or in the curb ramp or near the curb ramp. And I realize those of us here on the session from the east, you know, we have an older infrastructure. Things have been around maybe over a century or more, and it can be a real challenge like this, the scene you see on the left here. But the scene on the right, this sidewalk looks relatively new, but again, somebody didn't really understand the limitations or the needs of those with vision impairments. And uh, somebody I showed this slide to said, well, the guy wire is yellow. Everybody should be able to see that. Well, of course, the problem is not everybody can see or see clearly. And this can be a real, somebody can have a serious injury, almost decapitated if they would walk into that or depending how they would walk into that. So to me, this shows maybe the importance of maybe doing an on-site inspection before design and construction. I'm not sure exactly what happened here, but that's clearly not a good situation because someone with a cane cannot detect that wire going across the sidewalk because it's out of detectable range, but yet it can pose a hazard to them. Mentioned the importance of a level turning space. It's too bad we can't do a field activity. If you ever get a chance to get in a manual wheelchair, I encourage you to try this because a static photo does not do justice. To try to turn a wheelchair, a manual wheelchair, at the same time you're going up a steep grade is is a challenging task unless you have good upper body strength i think most people faced with this would probably the wheelchair would roll back down the ramp into the street or perhaps even flip over so ramps or turning spaces at the top of the ramp are critical in my opinion and it's not just for wheelchairs the last few years of his life my dad used a walker one of these walkers with two wheels in the front and kind of skids or ski skis on the back and he would have the same issue. For him trying to go up a ramp with his walker and turn at the same time was really, really challenging. In fact, sometimes I'd have to sort of hold on to him to make sure he didn't topple over. So curb ramps should be the basic element of accessibility. They should be our top priority. But for me, within a curb ramp or part of a curb ramp, the level turning space is critical. Uh, this one, maybe I should reword. The, Detectable warning surface uh, can be surface applied like this one appears to be, but notice the kind of the poor workmanship. Notice the lips here it can be a barrier to someone with a mobility impairment, but it looks like it's a potential tripping hazard to all pedestrians because that lip is more than a quarter inch vertically. Talked about this too, I guess. The detectable warning surface needs to be the full width of the ramp, everywhere the curb is missing. You know, here, I guess maybe for cost reasons or whatever, they just wanted one pad, but notice there's plenty of space here. Someone with low vision could actually walk right past this detectable warning surface without even realizing it. So this needs to be the full width of the sidewalk. And here we have another case, notice kind of a large curb radius here, large area where the curb is missing, but for some reason, they didn't put detectable warning surface here. The curb is still missing. Someone could still, with the vision impairment, could still accidentally walk into the street without realizing it. So that detectable warning should be everywhere the curb is missing. The ramp does not fit within the crosswalk. And notice this is a diagonal ramp. 
and I didn't mention diagonal ramps because in PROAG, these are no longer acceptable in new construction. We should not be building any more new diagonal ramps. And a couple things I would point out here. Notice one is this individual who came from the upper left here was in the crosswalk, but notice to reach the ramp, they have to leave the protection of the crosswalk to get lined up with the single diagonal ramp. And think about this, this, this individual is outside the crosswalk with their back to traffic where they can't keep an eye on it. So that's very disconcerting. And I don't think this one complies either. If you recall, someone asked about, or we talked about the clear space at the bottom of the ramp. That's one of the issues with the single diagonal ramp is there's not a 48 inch by 48, 48 inch clear space at the bottom of the ramp that's within the crosswalk and outside the uh, vehicular traffic lanes. So we shouldn't be building any more diagonal crosswalks or diagonal ramps. They may be okay in alterations if it's technically infeasible to use one of the other three types. But again, it's gonna depend on the individual context. We haven't really talked about signalization today, but another common mistake is at signalized intersections, not having a level area for the push button. If you think about how a person brakes, B-R-A-K-E, brake, B-R-A-K-E, a manual wheelchair, and I'm not sure this shows it, but the way they break a manual wheelchair is have a hand on each wheel to break it or to, to stabilize it or steady it. And think about this location here. Notice the push button is on the ramp, on a slope, maybe 8.3% slope. So to keep the chair from rolling down that slope, the individual is gonna have to have both hands on the wheels of the wheelchair and they don't have a free hand to activate the push button. So here you see there is a push button on a pole next to the turning space, that's a good thing. Probably what I would do is move this properly located push button over to this side of the curb ramp and then move this one to basically where or up at the top of the ramp here next to the, the turning space. But we do need to pay attention to that. And also the reach, we don't want people to have to reach very far to, to reach the uh, push button. Remember I said uh, detectable warnings, which are missing here, are like parentheses. They need to be used in pairs. Maybe why, that's why this one left out the detectable warning. There should be a detectable warning here, but notice there's no receiving ramp. This individual is now in the street in a wheelchair and no really visible, clearly visible way to get onto the sidewalk. So that is, to me, that's unacceptable. There needs to be a receiving ramp on the other side. Return curbs are misused which kind of relates to the flares. Notice here on the left, I'm not sure why they just didn't ramp the whole sidewalk down here, but notice we have the, I guess this would be the PAR, the accessible route with the curb ramp and the detectable warning. And this is the pedestrian circulation path. The issue is, and it's not so much accessibility as it is safety, but notice these vertical curb returns here within a pedestrian circulation path present the potential for a trip and fall hazard for able-bodied pedestrians. And then what inevitably can happen, of course, if someone's seriously injured, fractures a hip or something or a collarbone, then there may be a liability exposure for the, the state or local municipality. So it is important to pay attention to these, even though there's not really an accessibility issue here. I'd say there's a safety issue. And similarly here in this image on the right, notice this curb, raised curb along the left side of the sidewalk here actually extends into kind of the accessible path, which is, that's not good. Uh, but the other thing is, and, and in I took this photo in the morning, notice the shadows help 
kind of define that curve. But imagine later in the day when the sun is coming maybe from the right side, all that concrete color may blend together and someone may not be able to see that curb and may trip over the curb. So again, this is maybe more of a safety issue, a little bit of an accessibility issue, but don't misuse return curbs. And so that should have been 10 curb ramp mistakes. I wanna thank everybody for your attention and your good questions. I'll be glad to answer other questions that, that come in, Mike. Yes, thanks, Ron. We have a few minutes for additional questions. So there was a great question from Adrian who said, will this entire presentation be available for later viewing? And the answer is yes, we are recording this webinar. We will upload the recording to our LTAP YouTube site and send out a follow-up email to everybody. So uh, thanks for that. And also there is a copy of the PDF handout in the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, question from Greg. Are there any drainage issues that can occur by transitioning the gutter slope from a standard 8.33% slope to the flatter 5% max, i.e. on flatter profiles, won't this trap water? Yes, unfortunately that does often occur. And as I travel the country, that's something I've probably seen in almost every community I've been in. I think we all probably have where water will be at the base of the ramp. But yeah, that is, I mean, as you can do it, I guess, put inlets, you know, upstream to kind of intercept that water. But I realize that's may not always be, may not even be often possible. But yeah, we should try to pay attention to drainage to minimize the likelihood of that happening. And, and I realize that is a challenge, especially in flatter, flatter terrain. Just one of the other things we need to kind of, you know, try to pay attention to in terms of the details of designing these things. Thanks, Ron. There's a question from Mike. Is there a maximum chase length to get to 8.3% may not be possible when road is steep? Yeah, it's 15 feet. If you're trying to chase grade, pro access 15 feet. You don't have to go like forever, just go 15 feet when you're chasing grade. All right, thanks, Ron. Question from Michael. Why are blended transitions permitted since they look and function like diagonal ramps, which ProAg does not permit? Yeah, great question. <laughs> uh, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I agree. They they do kind of look at like a single diagonal ramp. and. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't give personal opinions, but my opinion, just in terms of sort of these three types of sidewalk to street transitions, is that uh, I usually put the blended transition at the bottom of that list in terms of, you know, I, I might try to do a perpendicular or parallel ramp first. And if those fail, then try to put in a blended transition. Uh, another, other issues with them, as you can probably appreciate, I'm not gonna waste time to try to go back to find one, an image but for the visually impaired a blended transition doesn't give very good guidance in fact they may be walking diagonally into the street so that's an issue another issue is uh, that uh, because so much of the curb is missing that sometimes drivers mistake that blended transition for a driveway or a side street and will actually turn onto the sidewalk. Maybe some of you have seen that. We've had some cases of that here in West Virginia. So what the road agency then does is maybe put bollards around that corner. And as you may be aware, bollards are a fixed object issue or hazard for bicyclists. So creates those sorts of issues. So I think the reason it's probably in there is probably because ProAg recognizes the realities of the natural you know, environment. ADAG is intended for buildings. And so you know, things are different in a, like a hallway of a building or a restroom of a building. You can do certain things that you couldn't do out in the natural environment. And I think ProAg probably recognizes that in some cases where you can't put in a perpendicular or parallel ramp, that a blended transition can be used, recognizing that it does have the drawbacks that I've, I've described for you. All right, thanks, Ron. We have a general question from Jessica. 
Should on-street ADA parking spaces be adjacent to curb ramps? Oh, good question. And uh, there's two cases that are described in PROAG. One is where you have sidewalks or right of way that I think is 14 or more feet in width. In that case, you can put the accessible space anywhere and you have to have an access aisle which could either be at the curb or on the traffic side and then you need ramps to serve that accessible space if your sidewalks are right of way or more more narrow than 14 feet which is probably the case maybe in most you know smaller communities in that case you can put the accessible stall at the end of the block such that folks can use the curb ramp at the corner to move between the sidewalk and the street. I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Ron. And we have reached 2.30. So I want to thank Ron Eck for presenting this webinar. We greatly appreciate it. We have provided Ron's email address there on the screen if you have additional questions. Thanks so much, everybody, for participating in this training. And Ron, any final comments? No, again, I just want to thank everybody as well. Hope the session was helpful and wish everybody a good rest of the day and a good holiday weekend. Thank you very much.